Till the 1970s, AM radio stations dominated the airwaves, and Richmond was no exception. Many have since signed off and faded from memory. But one of those local stations achieved legendary status, locally and nationally. If you were in the area at that time, chances are one of the buttons on your radio was set on... 1480 WLEE, Richmond. Everybody listened to WLEE. It was the station everybody listened to. I used to listen all the time to, to Big Lee. It was the station. The music, the jocks, and the jingles are what made WLEE cook. W. Lee had great personality, Saya. So Part of the family, actually. W. Lee was on all the time in my house. It was on in the car. W. L. E. E. back in those days, without all the things that we have today, was the station to listen to. It was a part of, of our growing up. 1480 W. L. E. E. But what so endeared W. L. E. E. to the community? How did it leave such a lasting impression on generations of listeners? And who were the people who made it happen? This is the story of 1480, WLAE Radio, Big Lee. I never, ever saw what happened to me at WLAE in the 70s happen before or since. In 50 plus years in broadcasting, I have never seen a community respond to and embrace a radio station the way Richmond did with WLAE. I love the place. There's some magic that happened in that building that I've just lived with to this day. I can, I'll just never forget it. In 1948, Baltimore businessman Tom Tinsley celebrated WLAE's sign-on at the mosque. His new station would broadcast over 1480. That frequency actually belonged to Grace Covenant Presbyterian Church, but Tinsley had negotiated a rare shared frequency deal with the church which allowed WLAE to broadcast over it, except for two hours every Sunday. Tinsley scored a major coup when he lured a young up-and-coming announcer named Harvey Hudson away from Crosstown Radio Powerhouse WRVA. Harvey had caught his attention doing the Streetman's Man of the Street interview programs. Also hired away from WRVA was veteran announcer Lud Sterling who, like Harvey, would become a popular longtime fixture at WLAE. Ring the bell with WLAE. WLAE's early studios were located in the basement of the Broad Grace Arcade, downtown at 3rd and Grace. Tinsley's affection for Robert E. Lee was what led him to choose the call letters, and the general's picture hung prominently in the station's lobby. Ruby Whitlow joined the station in 1950 and remained there until WLAE signed off the air 39 years later. It was a large, it was a huge office, a huge, we had about three control rooms and they always had to have an engineer there for each show. And also they had a very large, um, auditorium type with a baby grand piano to do, do a lot of um, recordings. The Happy Gang. Uh, sometimes um, the people from the Old Dominion Bar and Nance would come up and use the um, facility. Hall of Hits, Hall of Hits, it's your supper time, Hall of Hits. Listen to the tunes that made the grade. Here is Richmond's original hit parade. Harvey started as both WLAE's morning announcer and program director. The station's early music format was similar to WRVA's, featuring big bands and pop standards. But Harvey always felt that to compete with the established stations, WLAE would need more than just music. And to create publicity, almost anything went. Joe Murray lathered up in a local department store. And of course, Harvey himself was a master stuntman and promoter. Once he jumped out of an airplane to test a light fall suit. 
and demonstrated a Rockingham closed wash and wear line by falling into Bird Park Lake. You'd see Harvey everywhere, including frequent stops at the White Tower, one of his longtime sponsors. He was just a real character. He was, he was a showman. He was um, someone who made you feel very, very special. Harvey was a unique person. He was a great salesman. In those days, most all of the commercials we did on the air were live. And Harvey was the best at, at delivering a message for the sponsor. And he made you want that product. Uh, he represented Rockingham Clothes for Men. He represented Commonwealth Ford. If no event was scheduled, Harvey would just create one, always drawing huge crowds. He knew Lee's popularity was based on its commonality with listeners. He would broadcast from, and even atop, almost anywhere. The station became the eyes and ears of the community. Mobile radio equipped cars were highly visible at all newsworthy events, like the Camp Town races. And at any moment, Mickey Kahn could break in with one of his famous WLWE mobile news reports. Station promotions included several local beauty pageants, and they evolved into another WLE exclusive. One thing that we had a lot of success, we got the idea from my old friend Bernie Wayne, the writer of Miss America, that we ought to go to Atlantic City, and he got us a pass to get at the runway. Broadcasting live from the Miss America pageant, it was something else. Because we were the only radio station in the country broadcasting live from the Miss America pageant runway. And we were about three seats up from the band, the Glen Ossa band, and we had perfect view of the stage, and we saw everything that was going on, and we, it, it was just magic. But it was the stunts. It was the show business. That's how we took it away from the other stations. They were still running it like radio stations. Our guys each had his own personality and his own stunts, and whatever it took, we backed them up. <laughs> I'll never forget it. Everyone uh, was so shocked that night at the executive when Harvey just sort of uh, fell into the pool in full tuxedo, the whole works. He was talking to a group of girls in a contest, and he was telling them how beautiful they were. And he was just easing back, easing back, and they started hollering, Harvey, Harvey! And he took one more step, and then he was backwards in that pool. And the, no one knew that it had that it was a setup. Harvey Hudson had his Christmas show with Aunt Lil from his home. Um, and uh, we would listen to that. It was Christmas morning. Uh, it was special for all of the families. Uh, they, you know, although he said Aunt Lil, it was his mom. And uh, it, uh, you didn't have to worry about language. It was just a wholesome, good, heartfelt show. He just had a way of, of drawing people to him and drawing the listeners. He and Lud Sterling were a great morning drive combination. Um, Lud was kind of the, um, the comic, so to speak, where Harvey would be more the straight man. And they had a tremendous rating uh, in the morning drive. They were running up against Alden Air Road, WRVA and a lot of people listened to him. He had been a fixture for years. He knew how to kind of reach in and deliver. And I think that's really important because when you're doing something on air, you're not face to face. So th the interaction is different, but the way to be able to interact and connect and p draw people in, that's a skill. Harvey just had a way of talking with people. And not only did he hold good conversation when he talked, Harvey was an immaculate dresser. Always looked good. He was a personality that you really wanted to know and you really respected about his involvement in the community and connections in the community. Here I am, you're talking about when I'm in my 20s. Harvey was the kind of person that you 
You were, it was like a magnet. It was a personality plus kind of, of uh, offering that Harvey had over the radio that made him who he was. I mean, some people are stars and some aren't, and Harvey was one of those people. All the way up at the end of my street, there was a food giant or something like that, a giant grocery store, and Emperor Harvey Hudson was doing a remote broadcast up there from a bomb shelter, a giant bomb shelter. It was, over, it was overground, and I guess this was 59, 60, when that was kind of in people's frames of minds. I think he made it a point to get to know everybody personally. When he was out doing a remote broadcast, he'd shake your hand. Uh, he knew everybody in Richmond. Harvey Hudson from Lou Ray Caverns. I want to talk to Bob Harnsberger about people because I find the service at Lou Ray Caverns all the way through so kind and warm, and it's been open every yeah. day for those hundred years. Now, of the people who work here, how many are from Lou Ray itself? He was a WLE, and, and Alden was a WRVA, but they were both very recognizable names and and voices and everything else, all the things that you would you would expect. I mean, he could probably run for mayor and, and would have won. Due to Harvey's various promotions, WLAE was pretty much able to hold its own in the local ratings. But in 1958, Harvey had an epiphany. He was at Gary's Record Shop in Willow Lawn. The manager pointed to a stack of 45s and said, Harvey, see those? That's what people are buying. That's what they're listening to. That is what you should be playing on Lee. And the rest, as they say, is radio history. It was the first full-time station to start playing top 40 music, hit music, whatever you wanted to call it. Everybody else sort of remained in the Frank Sinatra, Rosemary Clooney uh, genre. And of course, the music like uh, uh, Fats Domino and Elvis, that, that was starting to be the music of the late 50s, early 60s, and, and WLEE was the only one doing it, and so everybody migrated over there. As you know, um, he may have had a giant teen audience and people associated that music with teens, but their mothers and fathers were all listening too. And uh, the ratings uh, ultimately reflected that. I think when I was there, um, the station was the dominant number one station, beating WRVA and Harvey Hudson, who did the morning show at Lee, beating Alden Aero, which was kind of unthinkable. Uh, it was uh, the golden era of the start of Top 40, and Lee uh, led the way. More music, 1480 WLEE. Well, they played the hits. They, uh, you know, and back then, we didn't complain about how many times a day they played them. You know, <laughs> the top 20, we wanted to hear them, you know, every hour. It's the music that was about life and love and people. And it wasn't like that nasty stuff that you hear today. WLEE was playing top 40 music, basically majority of the white artists and we at WANT, we were playing the hits of the black artists. The cool thing about the music was, is that you could hear the silly songs from the 60s. Chickaboom was one of my favorite songs. At the same time, you could hear the serious social conscience songs that, that came on. And I can even remember the first time I heard Led Zeppelin was on W. Lee. And so it was all kinds of the most modern top 40 music that kind of drew everybody together. It was good, you know, rock and roll, uh, and, and just things that, that were songs that you could sing to if you wanted to, and, and you know, were easy to, to listen to also. I remember the old uh, plastic pocket AM radio that you could plug into one ear and uh, always listening to WLEE for the rock. It was fun. It was a fun radio station. It was top 40. It was rock and roll, and top 40 at that time was a little bit of everything. A little bit of country, a little bit of soul, a little bit of rock and roll. And, uh, and that, you know, was a, it was a good mixture. Uh, it was a successful mixture for the station, without a doubt. That same year, 
A young man from Richmond walked into WLAE studios with a record he had just cut and asked if the station would play it. They did, and WLAE would become instrumental in launching what would become the biggest selling national and local single of the entire year 1958. That man's name was Tommy Edwards, and the song was Many a tear has to fall But it's all in the game We did a lot of contests um, that it was like non-stop. I remember one uh, they wanted listeners to vote on the disc jockey that they most wanted to send to Mars. Now this was not a positive uh, message for the disc jockey. This was like, you know, pow, we're sending you out of this world. And believe it or not, I was the one voted that the listeners uh, most wanted to send to Mars. Mars was Mars, Pennsylvania, which was a suburb of Pittsburgh. And so um, they pulled the names of a couple of listeners out of the hat and uh, Dave Lyman and I and the listeners went to Mars, had a big parade. I still have my Martian hat. W-L-E-E, Richmond. For a couple of years I did the music after hour show from the 9 to 11 p.m. portion from the Beacon Drive-In Restaurant on Broad Street and it was one of those things people pulled in, you went over to their car with a microphone and who are you and you know what are you having for uh, for your dinner tonight. I mean, the, the kind of stuff that you would never think about doing today was, was part of how that radio station functioned. And so you were really interacting with the audience continuously. The station was big in news and they probably had five full-time people in the news department. Uh, they had cars on the street. They uh, really promoted their news. In those days, radio was big. Uh, you had three TV stations, and radio still was very, very dominant. There was no FM. Competition was not uh, much. And as we just uh, stated, WLE was number one. So if you did something, people really heard it. They paid attention. They turned out. Uh, if we would uh, appear uh, at a street corner on our two-way radio saying, we're here to give out some movie tickets, I mean, you'd have people dozens and dozens of cars would pull up immediately. It wasn't like you're out there waiting for one car to come maybe in an hour. You had response from listeners. There was no restriction on what the disc jockeys could say on the air. And we were very involved in the community and if the phone rang and somebody had something that, that we thought was of interest, we were encouraged to put it on the radio. WLAE's talented 1963 air staff from the left included Don Keller, Dick Hemby, who went on to Atlanta, local advertising mogul Jess Boy, I think you know the visiting guy standing in front of Harvey, pageant director Juanita Hope, Lud Sterling, future Channel 12 sportscaster Jim Granger, and on the end, Rich Landrum, who became the announcer for Worldwide Wrestling. I think a lot of it had to do with Harvey Hudson. Harvey saw something in, I believe, saw something in me. And he would give me chances to do things that I don't know they were given any other new person to do. And it, it was unusual. Who at 16 years old starts at the number one station in Richmond? When I started, I was working part time and I was doing grunt work, really. And um, I didn't, I loved the music, but I didn't want to be a DJ. I wanted to be a news reporter. They had me doing mobile news liner reports. I had no radio, I had to do them over the phone. A lot of the cars had two-way radios. And uh, finally, Harvey said, you know, you're getting good at this. We're going to start paying you 50 cents a report. I went, wow, okay, great. You know, so I was always looking for a story to do. By the mid-60s, WLAE was a solid number one in the ratings. Pretty much a combination of contests, promotions, the music certainly, and personalities who really connected with the audience. The personalities that were presenting the music were just, you, you couldn't get enough of it. You know, you just, you tuned in and they're like, 
talking to you. Three minutes after three, leave most music Saturday at the radio and Ronnie Ronnie. Cracklin' Rosie, Neil Diamond on WLEE at 6 after 3, Lee Most Music, Ronnie, Ronnie, Brandon, Saturday, and WLEE, Million Dollar Weekend, Extra Special Million Dollar Weekend, History of Rock and Roll starts 6 o'clock tonight. Well, we were kind of in the right time at the right place with uh, WLEE. In those days, most of the audience had pretty much grown up with top 40 or contemporary rock and roll music which was a happy music. It was a lot of fun, and the, the entire station was kind of uh, configured around that attitude. 1480, WLEE, just for the fun of it. Tatic Henry in Manchester battling out for the heck of it tonight on Roll Call on WLEE at 6.05. <laughs> Do you need one? Tell us why, and WLEE will send you one. Just send a self-addressed stamped envelope to one. WB Box 8765, Richmond. Nobody should be without one. You're right. In the past couple of weeks, demand has been slightly more than overwhelming. Bobby Waymark has written in and says, Think of all the people at school who will envy me when they know that I have one. Also, my girlfriend will flip when she finds out that I have one. I might even give it to her to wear along with my ring. That's a good idea. I might let Susie wear mine. Susie, would you like to wear mine? Yeah. Hmm. People liked it. We got to know the people around town. We did tons of appearances. I don't think there was a furniture store or a, uh, a car dealer in, in the city of Richmond that at one time I did not broadcast my show from and, and on some occasions many times over. So we, we were exposed to, to being out and about in town and actually meeting the people who listened to the radio station. Back then, the, the disc jockeys were stars. I mean, they were local hometown uh, personalities that you could go meet on remotes and uh, call on the telephone and get a request. And so I think it was the local involvement and just being in touch with the audience that made it kind of a, a cool thing. The, the really cool thing was to hear your name on the air if you called in with a request. And all the contests and things that you could win, you know, listening to W. Lee, it, it just felt like part of our family, you know, and it was something that um, we just gravitated to. I think it was the music and the disc jockeys. I mean, it was a whole package, everything, uh, you know, whether they were they're coming to our school, Freakish Five, or whether it was the contests, which, you know, I was a 10, 12-year-old kid when I started listening and getting anything free. Good guy gold from the 60s and Eddie Kurtz out on Belafonte Road in Richmond just ripped me off at a grab the gold weekend at WLAE. Big Lee, million dollar weekend. Always listening out at night for the weather forecast, praying for snow so we could miss the school the next day. All day long I would listen to WLAE because we were just coming of age and that's where the music was, that's where the hits were. I think people could relate to the personalities on the radio station and that was what was so good for me. When you hear people that maybe you didn't know at that time when they were on and you know the name like Harvey Hudson, you hear that name, you feel like you know him. They had a wide range of, of, of disc jockeys and announcers. So different times of the day you were hearing different things but the same good music and it just, it just drew me to it. They were fun, they were enjoyable, there was uh, the station was quick from one song to another and lots of clever dialogue from the DJs. And I think that's, particularly as a young person, that's what drew us to the station. It was exciting. They had a finger on the pulse of what was important, what was important to the community. But they also really want to entertain. One thing I always got a kick out of was the several different ways people would refer to WLAE's call letters. Some would call it Big Lee, some would just call it Lee, some went with Willie, and then there were these. I used to call W. Lee, W. Lee. Um, my dad, for some reason, used to call it Double L, Double E. I'm not sure why he called it that, but it seemed, that seemed to be a generational drawing line right there. I would say W. L. E. E. Or Lee. I called it W. L. E. E. My father called it W. L. Double E. Double L, double E. No, man, I, well, that is just totally embedded in my brain forever. More W L E E.
For me, personally, it was an incredible rush being on WLAE during all those years that it was such a dominant radio station. In 50 plus years of broadcasting, I never ever experienced the type of audience reaction that WLAE generated. School administrators complained that our school spirit contest was disrupting classes as students were passing around petitions to win a dance at Tantilla. 85 million signatures later, Hermitage High won the dance. WLAE got to front most of the local pop concerts. Here's my fellow DJ, Ron Brandon, with a couple of monkeys, Davy Jones and Mickey Dolans. I thought the Coliseum roof would literally blow off the night I introduced the Osmonds. Donnie looked at my outfit and said, don't quit your day job. Tiny Tim tiptoed in through the tulips to be on the card with the Lovin' Spoonful and Three Dog Night at Parker Field. Beach Boy, Mike Love, used me as a headrest before they performed at the old Richmond Arena. It was a pie in the eye contest, and as I recall, it was Lemon Meringue that Chris Kay in the middle decorated Terry Jordan's and my face with. Here, Terry and I were bookends for a Miller and Rhodes teen board member. On the far right, Dick Roos, who was WLAE's outstanding music director and on-air talent. We're putting a man in Richmond City Council. That man's got to be Randy Scott. There was a controversial Richmond City Councilman named Howard Carwile, and the station decided I should run against him as a write-in. It was more like a write-out. But I would like to thank my other voter. Randy Scott. I got you. Ladies and gentlemen, you're listening to Music Power, W-L-E-E, -E, Richmond. Joe Tex got you at 8.32, W-L-E time. This is a Randy Scott thing until 9, at which time Terry Jordan slips into the air chair on Big League. And they called it. Well, it's the 22nd day of December. You gotta watch yourself in the department store, especially in the toy department. Some of these manufacturers are really sneaky. I saw one yesterday who was selling a toy microscope for eleven ninety eight, but the germs are extra. Big Lee Summertime! Ever tell you about my dog Trini? <laughs> Pretty smart little dog. I've taught her to eat only when she hears a bell. Yesterday, she had five dinners. Four steaks and an Avon lady. Elton John, here at the Coliseum this Saturday night. It's got to be a sellout. Got to be a dynamite show. That's Rocket Man. We'll play that one especially for our Rocket Men, who I'm happy to report the world is glad to hear are in excellent health after their splashed out just two days ago. Skylab astronauts are getting along just fine. A little shaky on their legs yet, but what the heck? You ought to see me every morning. W-L-E-E. -E. This Randy Scott on a Wednesday. Remember, friends, life is only what you make it. You make it the most. 1480 W-L-E-E, -E, Richmond. During the early 70s, there was one W-L-E-E DJ whose slightly unusual style would generate the highest nighttime ratings in the history of W-L-E-E. Shane was kind of the, seemed to be the maverick a little bit, and, and just, you know, some of the things that, that he said were just, you know, really kind of, you'd, you'd laugh at. Right on, right on, right on. 9.47 going to 11. Not a shade show time. Big Lee, honey, and the Mountain of Music giveaway has just started. We've got more albums to win. And now, more football scores, brought to you by Nick's House of Steaks, Staples Mill, and Broad. Terminage, 14, Highland Springs, 13, if you've got a score, I want it. 2827651 or 288-2835, dig. See if you get time, Miller. San Francisco, right. And roast. Living in a huge Every time I opened that microphone, I had, it sounded like I was just 
off the cuff. But I wrote my show every every night at home from 10 o'clock till 2 o'clock in the, in the morning I would write. So that when I introduced an act or I was talking about a situation or I was coming out of the news and loving every minute at WLE, it was just a great, great experience in my life. Uh, but I knew what I was going to do. And it sounded like I didn't. But the words came through and the emotion came through to the people that I touched and they thought, all right. He's my guy. You know, Shane had that aspect of being able to connect to teenagers. That was his whole promotion. The, the TV ads of him rolling down the hill with the ponytail flapping in the breeze. And uh, I mean, that was that was and Shane was kind of like the first hippie disc jockey uh, in Richmond. <laughs> is like that soft and gentle and yet it lacks no power whatsoever it's a very mind structured album it's certainly not a spine rocker but it is nice to listen to and really enjoyable to just lay down with your chick put your heads between the speakers and relax and seals and cross the album is summer breeze i like it and thoroughly endorse it for you you can take an endorsement from a plastic freak like me it's 1008 how you doing 54 downtown richmond agrees we're swinging honey tonight if you're going to introduce an act you want the audience to be pleasantly surprised by that act. So every time I played a record on the air, it wasn't like the morning shift. It wasn't like the mid... I was the first top 40 rock and roll disc jockey in America. There was ever... In fact, I'm considered I'm in books as one of the fathers of album rock stations because I was the only guy that could play. And if, if, anybody, if anybody out there remembers, I was uh, actually allowed to play up to four album cuts an hour. This is not done in those days. Well, as you know, Friday nights drive a mind like mine absolutely stark raving mad, correct? <laughs> now and again, I got, to, I got to get a little something mellow in here, just lay back, forget about the telephones and everything, so uh, dig. Big Lee, two in a row. Until I seen you rock and roll, baby. This is Gary Glitter. Jam up song, a little rock. Got a Friday night with Sonny Shaw and sailing up at 11. One of the other things that I'm most proud of in this life is that when the first time I got on the air, the very first night, I had done some scouting. And when I got on the air, the first thing I did was say, Good evening, City of the Monuments. And that's what I called Richmond, was the City of the Monuments. So the day I got on the air, the day I left. So now I come to find out that it's actually a line and this kid that used to listen to my show was a fan of mine. He wrote a song which was the unofficial and now official uh, state song of Virginia and in that song is the city of the monuments and I'm very proud of that because I created that. Take me out to the country My brother Steve, our youngest brother, his, he had a son and he called Shane online, called him on the phone and said, I've named my boy after you, Shane Grubbs. And he spells his name a little different because then I was listening to him on the radio and he said, hey, some, some dad just named his kid after me. Well, isn't that great? Not only do I remember that, but I remember the same kind of thing happening in Buffalo where somebody called me up and she's having a baby, could you help us, could you what? And while she was delivering the baby, they brought into the studio and I played, I played uh, Isn't She Lovely. The station was integrated into the community in a variety of different ways, but a very prominent part of that were all the local beauty pageants that the station sponsored and coordinated. Cause you've got personality, walk with personality, talk with personality. 1971, I was crowned Miss WLE Personality. And this was a, a fun c contest that uh, brought in a lot of girls who were sponsored by various companies. I was Miss Giant Food. And I was crowned at the Executive Motor Hotel on Broad Street that's no longer there. 
but it was an iconic building. I think everybody remembered it, and it was just a wonderful place to, to have a, a special pageant. And WLAE made it a very special pageant because uh, we were there inside, and, and we'd go out by the pool, and I remember Harvey Hudson was the, the MC. And uh, it was, it was a, um, an exciting event for all the young girls. WLAE also, being the community um, steward that it was, they, um, they were one of the sponsors for the Miss Richmond pageant, and I was, I was in that for a couple of years as well. I always thought one of our best promotions at the station was our Freakish Five DJ basketball team. I'll never forget, we were invited to play a game inside the old Virginia State Penitentiary. Now, if you can imagine, there's five really out of shape guys going up against a team of well-conditioned inmates who spend every available minute playing basketball. And it was probably the only game we ever played where armed guards were present. But our games against faculty members at local junior high and high schools help raise a lot of money for them. From time to time, Richmond resident Curly Neal of the Harlem Globetrotters would suit up and join us. Of course, by halftime, we freaks were all pretty much sucking wind, and even though the faculties cut us a lot of slack, our perfect record of no wins and uncountable losses remained intact. A real highlight for us was getting to play Meadowlark Lemon, Curly Neal, and the Harlem Globetrotters at the old Richmond Arena. Let's just say the Globetrotters' perfect no-loss-ever record was never threatened. Now, you really hate to point fingers, but perhaps some of our on-court futility could be attributed to our coach. It was decided that since at that time I was portraying the Bowman body on WXEX TV, that it would be a wonderful idea to have me as being part of a basketball team. You don't really see too many basketball players with a heavy black cape and a white face and makeup, and that, but they thought this would be a good idea. So the station put it together and decided that I would be part of the Freakish Five. And as such, basically what I did was run up and down the court and look stupid and try to throw the basketball somewhere near the basket, which I was never terribly successful at. But people would scream and yell. I won't say what they were screaming and yelling, but they did, did scream and yell. In what might have been a preview of things to come, the Bowman Body and WLAE's Bob Travis were shooting a Freakish Five promo at Channel 8 when Bowman showed us how not to catch a pass. Fortunately, Bill Bowman survived that. By the late 1960s, WLAE was named the 13th most popular AM radio station in the nation. And that musical muscle enabled WLAE to not only play the hits, but to break them as well. If I didn't have a dime, if I didn't take the time to play the jukebox, don't play the jukebox. Saturday night would be a sad and lonely night for me. We had put the record out on a local label called Colpar here in Richmond. We took it to WLEE and Dick Roos, who was program director, music director. He liked the song. He had a friend at Columbia Records in New York. He said, let me play it for him on the phone, which he did. They liked it, sent him a couple copies, and within six weeks, we were on Columbia Records. It was one of those magical stories, and it was all because of WLEE. It was number one in several cities, uh, in Raleigh and out west, and certainly it was number one here in Richmond in June of 1969. As a general rule, most top 40 radio stations weren't known for their news departments. But from the very beginning, Harvey insisted on a top flight news operation. And WLAE had some big time talent in that newsroom. Certainly among them was George Clark, who was there from the beginning and who the station claimed was the South's first African-American newscaster. There was some really good talent there. There was Nikki Granberry, who went on to work uh, at Channel 8 as a reporter, and then went on to Detroit. And uh, again, Mike Cavanaugh, Henry Schmidt, uh, they, were, they were listenable, they were credible. And I think that if we had any kind of competitive, I, I wouldn't call it an advantage, but if that kept us competitive, I suppose, to a certain degree. Eyewitness News reports at 8.24. I'm Henry Schmidt. 
They're still trying to figure out who did... Currently in the All-American City, 26 degrees. David Edwards reporting, hear news every hour on the hour on W. Lee. James Banzer reporting. Virginia Rescue Squad Association official L.E. Phillips tells Eyewitness News this week... We were credible because of the intensity with which we covered the story. We were all journalists and we were very dedicated to our profession. And when something happened, we went after the story. The biggest obstacle we had um, in uh, obtaining the news when we went to news sources uh, was acceptability because we were not quite as recognizable as WRBA radio. We had the uh, mobile unit and uh, we had the budget whenever we needed to go somewhere. I never knew management to say no. Yes, WLAE did take its news coverage very seriously, but I think every news department of the country has its own behind the scenes humorous stories of things that happened during live newscasts. I happened to look up once during my show, Frank Richardson was doing the news across from me, and one of our disc jockeys started bouncing in front of him through the newsroom on a pogo stick. To his credit, Frank briefly looked up, did one of his eye rolls, looked back down, and didn't miss a beat. So I walked over in Rivenstead and saw that Elvis had died, and I go into the studio, and, I'm, and he starts laughing, oh, news face is in here, news, what's going on, news face, what, we got big breaking news, and I'm going, this isn't, don't, this isn't funny. He says, oh, girl, what's going on? Give it. And I, he went, well, this isn't funny. And then he, of course, gathered himself and delivered the, 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 uh, the word in a very, uh, well, the way it should have been, I suppose. We laughed about that for some years. I went to a fire one time, and, uh, and a woman came out of the house, and she was clad in her robe, and she said she had been sitting and she smelled smoke and ran out of the house. And uh, she said, I don't have anything on. And she pulled her robe apart and she was telling the truth. Touch me in the morning. By 1973, WRVQ had started to erode away W. Lee's nighttime pop music audience. But Lee would bring in a disc jockey after Shane left to take the nighttime shift, who would pretty much hold his own against WRVQ. And he would become Lee's first and only ever screaming disc jockey. A dream come true. I mean, I'd always listened to it and I dreamed I would one day be working there. And to be able to go there when I was younger, I'm talking eighth grade, ninth grade, and see the DJ, and then to work in that studio with virtually almost the same equipment, a dream come true. It was so much fun. Big Lee, it's Terry Young. We're rocking the mic right, baby, all the way to midnight. My own father was in the business, and he told me I didn't have what it took to make it because I didn't have a good voice. Uh, I learned that I was going to have to have a gimmick. I would go into the newsroom and just grab news copy and just go and just start reading it in a gruffy voice just to get raspy. So when I got on the air, I could scream. And after I would scream for a half an hour, 45 minutes, I could uh, come out and go on the air for the next five hours and it, that would sound like my natural voice. I love music. Oh, geez, on w. Lee, I love music is the name of the song. This is Terry Young reminding you that the prize Patrol will be on the road looking for your car. To see if it's got a Spirit of America bumper sticker that are available at 7 Eleven stores. You know that it would be untrue. The streak, Ray Stevens. And it was the it was it was the latest thing. And you'd be watching Howard Cosell and somebody would streak the, the game he was covering. Um, so I decided to streak on the air. Listen, call them the streak. I took something off every 15 minutes and prolonged the thing. But yeah, I, I, I took all my clothes off and then sat down in the chair. Whoo, the chair's cold, because um, I was nude. Other than Harvey Hudson, one voice remained a constant behind a WLAE microphone for the longest period of time, from 1973 till 1981. And interestingly, by profession, he was a television engineer. 
17 before 11 o'clock, Sunday night, Richmond. Guy Spiller Show headlines are open for you. I'm waiting to hear from you. What you want to hear on the radio tonight? 282-7651 is my number. 282-7651. This is brand new from Chicago. It's called Old Maid. Old I never aspired to be on the air. I'm, I'm an engineer guy. I'm in the back room. I'm, but this license just opened up opportunities for me that I never would have imagined I would do. So I remember my, my first night there, I was absolutely terrified, terrified. And I, I'll never forget that. So that's, that's how it happened. But the longer I was there and I was, I was sort of okay. I mean, that must not have been too horrible because they let me come back. Richmond Radio on the radio. WLEE, it's Donna Summer for you from 1980. It's 1034. Good evening to you. This is Guy Spiller going up until 11 or so tonight. The music evolved a bit over the period I was there. When I started, it was a little bit more uh, rock oriented, a little bit more teen oriented as it had, had been. And then with the, I guess they saw WRBQ taking a large part of the teen audience, they, they took the music uh, to a little older, older demographic. But it was, it was subtle, it was so subtle that you didn't really, you didn't really notice it. W-L-E-E, B.J. -E. Thomas, won't you play another Somebody Done Somebody Rock song? Uh, no, no, I won't do that. It's 11 minutes until 11. Guy Spiller Show, Big Lee. Weather for tonight is going to be cold. Again. What's it doing cold this time in April? I don't understand. Fair and cold for tonight. Low around 32. Tomorrow, clouds, but it's going to be nice. 65 degrees. It is 44 at W-L-E-E -E with Neil Sedeca. I wasn't at Lee very long, but I was there long enough to finally, you know, attain that big dream I'd always had of being able to say the call letters on the microphone, play the records, and we were still playing records then. We had a whole wall of, of 45s back there. It wasn't, wasn't CD then, it was records. At that time, Lee was more of a middle of the road top 40. It was playing more Barbara Streisand uh, and Kenny Rogers stuff. Uh, as opposed to uh, the Amboy Dukes or the Rolling Stones, or uh, they had some Beatles songs they would play, but it was geared not toward a so much a teenage younger audience, but more of a middle-aged, maybe a little bit older audience at that time. Dance with me, I want to be a partner. Can't you see? By the late 1970s, the FM competition prompted WLAE, one of the pioneers of Top 40 Radio, to begin to alter its music format. When we got there in 1979, we did some market research and pretty quickly came to the conclusion that WLAE really wasn't viable to continue on in a strict Top 40 format. The market was changing, WRVQ was coming on strong, a lot of listeners were migrating over to the FM dial, and we really thought we needed to upgrade uh, the sound of the station to be a little more adult contemporary in format. As part of that transition, uh, I renamed the station Richmond Radio. It was really designed to uh, make us sound like we were uh, all over the city. W-L-E-E -E is Richmond Radio. If you haven't been listening, take a closer look at what you're missing. Yates Davis Film Reviews, Orioles Baseball and Redskins Football, and informative AccuWeather. WLEE 1480 is Richmond Radio. But yet another, even more drastic music format change would occur at WLEE in 1981. And this would mark WLEE's final departure from playing the current hits of the day. I was working weekends, as I did for a long time. And I, I worked one of the last two or three nights of the old format of Lee. It was poignant because one of the things that was on the commercial log for those nights were a promo by the current program director explaining the new format that was coming up. The, all the non-rock hits of the 40s and 50s and whatnot. And I was thinking, oh my, this is going to be 
deadly. So there was a corporate decision made to, uh, to move the station to a, uh, uh, a format that was kind of hot at the time called Music of Your Life. It was designed to really appeal to a much older demographic. And I wasn't in favor of that decision, I'll be very honest. I, I fought against that. I really thought we were doing well as it was. But the decision had been made. I want you to hear the new W. Lee 1480 because we're playing music that you probably haven't heard for a long time. It's all the non-rock popular hit music of the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. The classic pop vocalists, the big bands. It's the music of your life, and it's here for you to enjoy on the all-new W. Lee AM 1480. You're going to love it. I will say that I thought the format was, was fairly polarizing. You either really liked it or you really didn't. And so we, we worked very hard to appeal to the people that seemed to have a positive reaction to it. We had a great team in place. We worked hard. We did everything we could to make that station a huge success. And uh, I, I will always look back very fondly at those years. Harvey Hudson had ceased doing his morning show in 1970 to become a broadcast executive. But by the middle 80s, Harvey would return to the WLAE microphone and the community that he loved. His core audience was there, and they followed him. And uh, Harvey, uh, Harvey was probably the finest self-promoter I have ever met in this business. And I've been in it 54 years, and I learned a lot from Harvey. Uh, I have a packet of his stuff that I look at every once in a while and say, you know what, I think I'll pull that one up and try it again, because it was tried and true marketing, and he was the best that I ever knew. He used uh, the station um, and that morning show, um, and he, he was out selling as much as he was on the air, and those old days of radio worked. We had some people that were pretty passionate about that format. Floyd Henderson, for example, uh, was there. It was like the music of your life. You could cover different eras, which was fine with me because I cover a lot of eras. It was all packaged, so I could talk in and around the music, and I had a good time. And I could go from rock uh, to big bands to country and western songs, you know, the crossover kind of songs. It was an older audience, a mixed audience, I should say. And it was music of your life. And I hate to repeat that, but that's what it was. Everybody loves somebody, somebody. I fall to pieces. Oh, Juju. Won't you juju me, huh? Chattanooga, Chattanooga. Get aboard. Chattanooga. Ironically, not believing FM radio had any future, Management had sold WLE's 106.5 frequency in the 60s. Facing dwindling ratings and revenues, in 1989, one of America's all-time great AM radio stations finally succumbed to the economic pressures brought on by FM radio. It was sad because of the, the, the fact that the legacy part of that radio station, in my opinion, had died in the 70s when they went to uh, adult contemporary and it dropped the, uh, the top 40 that it had been known uh, in this marketplace. It was disappointing. It was sad. It was kind of like losing a friend. And then you're out there looking like, where do we go now? It was one of the saddest things I've experienced because you, you could see what was happening and to see it from the inside like that and to have the long-term view that I had from being there so long. Well, I think we were all sad, and some of us had been there for a while. We say that it was closing, and that was the end of an era. That was it. Things were changing. There is little doubt that since the first radio station signed on the air back in the 1920s, radio has undergone many changes. But in the end, do those changes really enable the stations to better serve the communities that they're licensed to? So many of the shows are syndicated now, and um, you just don't have that, that uh, immediate connection that we used to have. And I think that's, that's sad for all of the listeners today. What we know today as terrestrial radio was really meant to be a local medium instead of uh, 
the kinds of shows that we have now syndicated from California was really meant to be local. And I think it was more fun then. Back when radio was radio, when WLEE, WANT, we served the community we broadcast to. We were out in the community. We did things for the community. Back then, I really believe that the announcers played such a personality role in what they were doing on their shows, that also drew them, drew the audience to them. People weren't less listening to somebody who was in Chicago or New York, they were listening to somebody who was in Richmond. It was a Richmond program. And I think that combination, plus the fact that the people doing it were very, very good, uh, made it a very popular station. It was very personal, very innocent, even though we were coming out of an innocent age and moving into something more socially responsible. Lee, I think, was that youthful innocence that uh, we had growing up. Sadly, I'm afraid the days of, of the old radio stations will never be with us again. But uh, man, the memories are just, um, they're as fresh today as they were 40 years ago for me. Through the years, hundreds of support staff and voices were behind the WLAE microphone. But in the end, we were all merely caretakers for the house that Harvey Hudson built. Very unpretentious, just a, a wonderful man, and uh, we really miss him. A long, long time ago, I can still remember how that music used to make me smile. And I knew if I had my chance that I could make those people dance and maybe they'd be happy for a while. But something touched me deep inside the day. The music died.